Good evening. I'm Beth Keller from Highland Park Public Library. We'd like to welcome you to this special event, an evening with Highland Coben in conversation with Sherry LaPena. Tonight's special program is presented by a partnership of your public libraries and is hosted by Aurora Public Library District, Glencoe Public Library, Highland Park Public Library, Lake Villa District Library, Niles Main District Library, Northbrook Public Library, Vernon Area Public Library, and Wilmette well, Public Library. Tonight, Harlan Coben will discuss his new book, Win, which is already a number one New York Times and USA Today bestseller. Thanks to Barbara's Bookstore and to the Bookstall for supporting this event with online sales. Links to purchase Win from these stores can be found in the chat box on your screen. A signed book plate will be included with each copy of Win purchased while supplies last. Purchases of the book will support these local bookstores. Following tonight's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. You can submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and typing in your questions. My colleague, Raz Topolsky from Vernon Area Public Library will moderate the question and answer session. Please note that as an attendee tonight, your microphone and camera are turned off. Closed captioning has been enabled. You can turn off the closed captioning by clicking on the live transcription icon at the bottom of your screen. I'd now like to turn it over to Caitlin Hannon from Northbrook Public Library to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. So with more than 75 million books in print worldwide, Harlan Coben is the number one New York Times bestselling author of numerous suspense novels, including The Boy from the Woods, Runaway, Don't Let Go, Home, and Fool Me Once, as well as the multi-award winning Myron Bolitar series. He is also the creator and executive producer of many television shows, including several critically acclaimed Netflix original drama series. These include The Stranger, Safe, The Woods from Netflix Poland, and The Innocent from Netflix Spain, releasing globally on April 30th. Coben is developing 14 projects with Netflix in the US and internationally, including original series in France, the UK, and the USA. Sherry Le Pena is the internationally best-selling author of the thrillers The Couple Next Door, A Stranger in the House, An Unwanted Guest, Someone We Know, and The End of Her, which have all been New York Times and the Sunday Times of London bestsellers. Her books have been sold in 37 territories around the world. The paperback edition of The End of Her goes on sale on June 1st, and her next book, Not a Happy Family, goes on sale from Pamela Dorman Books and Viking on July 27th. And she lives in Toronto, where she is also joining us from today. So thank you, Sherry and Harlan, for joining us this evening. And I'm going to hand it over to both of you now to start tonight's conversation. Thank you, Caitlin. <clears throat> well, it's a pleasure to be here. Hi, Harlan. Hey, Sherry, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, thanks. And I just, I have to congratulate you. Number one, first week out with Win. Yeah. Well, well deserved. Thank I love this book. And anyone who hasn't read it yet will have to go get it and read it because it's really, really good. Well deserved, that number <laughs> well, one. You probably, you know this, and I don't <laughs> people know this, but so uh, Wednesdays, if your, your book comes out, our books always come out or usually comes out on a Tuesday. And then the following Wednesday, or every Wednesday around five o'clock Eastern Standard Time, the New York Times releases their list. So all of publishing is sort of hanging by, used to be a fact <laughs> when I first started, hanging by the email, um, waiting to hear it. I was actually doing a radio interview uh, live on in New Zealand, and uh, my phone dinged and my publisher had all these exclamation points and one on it. So um, I, I let a little Yelp during my interview <laughs> with New Zealand. Yelps are good, but what do you do to celebrate something like that? I mean, number one, that's a life goal for me. Uh, um, I usually do nothing. I, I, I really can't, no, I mean, I, 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 when I, my kids aren't around. I, I, I text my kids and they all post it on their own social media, which is so cute. But usually I really just like to sit and think for a second it's just like wow i mean wow it's really it never gets old it just is uh, i love to try to grab those moments and, and appreciate them and um and then move on from there but it's a it's a great feeling i have i have cosmic like you know very zen 
uh, more important. And then, you know, the dog started to nip on my leg saying, can I go out for a walk? So it gets right back to normal. Well, it must be good after we know the work that goes into a book. So, you know, when you're struggling with the book and, and you're in the, the, the dumps there with the book, it's so nice to have those moments, you know, after yeah. all the work. <clears throat> well, I loved Wynne, both the book and the character. And I'd like to talk a bit about Wynne, the character, if we can, for a bit. I found him absolutely fascinating because he's, he's charming, he's funny, he's, you know, he's larger than life. He's this super wealthy guy who travels around in, you know, fancy jets and helicopters and he drinks all the fine wines. And, you know, he can, he can knock anybody down and, and beat them up. And he's sort of, he's almost like a superhero. Um, so he seems like sort of over the top, but he's also, he's very, very human. And so on the one hand, he's, he doesn't understand or he doesn't get the things that normal people get, like, like romantic love. He doesn't get that. Right. And, you know, you know, he's going around being all suave and everything, but he, he actually really enjoys violence. So he likes to beat people up. And I wonder, you know, is he a bit of a psychopath? Can you tell us what yeah. you think of Wynn? I, I think he's a little bit of a sociopath. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's so funny because somebody kind of commented that, you know, wow, you know, I guess you write books of sociopaths. I'm like, if you want the nice guy, read my other 32 novels. <laughs> you know, I want it. It's a, it is a change. And um, <laughs> So everybody, people seem to be embracing the change. Maybe I should have gone uh, a little more psycho earlier. But so for those who don't know, Wynn was a sidekick, um, a vented Wynn, if you will, in the early 90s when I started my Myron Bolotar series. I always loved the sidekick. Um, Batman and Robin, Spencer and Hawk, Sherlock and Watson. And so I wanted to give Myron that kind of a, a character. I'm seeing technical difficulties popped up. Is there a problem that we should know about? Closed captioning. Oh, te they're working on the closed captioning. I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, I, I always wanted that for, for this character. And so uh, when I created Myron, I based Win off my college roommate. Who has, <laughs> he has a name equally. Is he listening tonight? <laughs> he knows it's him. He's still my best friend. But oh, good. when we first met in college, back in those days, uh, some of you were a little older. You remember we had actual Facebooks, not Facebook. We had actual Facebooks when we came in as a freshman in college that showed you pictures of everybody. And I remember going through the book with my my dad and going, look at this ass. I won't even see this guy. You know, the smug. He looked just like Wynn. Gorgeous blonde hair and the smug look on his face. I just wanted to, you just want to punch him. And end up, end up we became best friends right away. And before we'd go out to a party, he would look in the mirror and go, it must suck to be ugly. So I took this guy and I tweaked him. Now the real win can fight his way out of a wet paper bag, but people hated him on site. They just detested him. And because of that, you know, had the whole haughty thing going on. So what we tried to do or what I tried to do was, well, what would happen if that went a little farther? And that was kind of how I started to create win and he was much more damaged earlier on the, the the real challenge was also making him you know evolve and change from the early days without with still being who win is you know mm -hmm. as he puts it batman's only superpower is that he's really rich which is win superpower yeah but he is he is a very complicated person so he's sort of he's over the top like a batman but he is really human you know, the way he, he feels about, you know, Myron, his best friend, he's got all these strong feelings of friendship with Myron, and yet he can't understand romantic love. So he's, he's just a really compelling, really interesting character. And for a psychopath, he's totally likable. He's got a great sense of humor. And he's quite, um, he's just very funny and disarming. I, I really enjoy him as a character. So yeah, I can see where people are embracing this sort of charming psychopath and really enjoying being with him. So I really hope you do some more win books. I hope so too. I mean, this was a, an experiment. There's a number of readers out there, I'm sure who I've been asked to do a win book forever. And I've always said no for the very reason I think that people have always asked. And also I've always believed wins always been maybe my most popular character. But as a sidekick, I always thought less was more that the reason yeah. why you wanted more of him is because I didn't give you more of him. So I've resisted this urge 
to, or not, it hasn't been an urge for me, but I resisted uh, mm. the, the, the calls to have a win book. And what happened was I, I was coming up with the idea for this one and realizing the world. I wanted a stolen Vermeer painting. I wanted an heiress who had been kidnapped. I wanted an upper west side penthouse apartment. Well, this was Wynn's world. Mm. Um, and so I said, let's give it a try. The other thing, Sherry, and I'd be curious of your response to this. I've always sort of prided myself that I'm Myron and my friend is Wynn. Uh, but what I've also learned is there's probably more of me in Wynn than I like to admit. I, I think when people read Wynn, even when you are repulsed by him, you find there's something alluring about the way he makes these kind of decisions. You have mm -hmm. characters like that where you think, oh, this is the one who's kind of more like me, but actually you find out that it's actually another character that you may sympathize with more? Um, I don't know for sure. Like I do like to go in and explore all of them and all my characters are usually, um, there's something off about a lot of them. And it says something about us, all of us crime writers who really like to explore those people. But uh, yeah, I mean, we have an affinity for those kinds of characters, don't we? Which is probably why I enjoyed, I enjoyed Wynn so much. Okay. Because, you know, I like the psychopath. All my books have psychopaths in them. I really enjoy them. I find them really interesting. And, you know, a psychopath doesn't necessarily have to be a violent serial killer. You can have a psychopath who's quite charming. And, you know, Wynn does like his violence, but he also likes his fine wines and um, he's just a really, one of the most original characters I've seen in a while. So I, I really hope we have more of him. I quite I like it. it. And based off what happened, I, I assume so. Um, or Myron, one of the two or both, I hope to have, I do hope to have back, not next book. Next book will be a sequel to The Boy from the Woods, which is maybe also a sequel to The Stranger now. I didn't intend for that to be, but it's sort of happening as I'm writing it. But I think Wynn also has a self-awareness that that makes him tolerable. It's not like he doesn't mm -hmm. get where he is and, and who he is and what he's doing. He mm -hmm. kind of does. Um, but it was, you know, he was, it was, it was a little easier to get in that head. And the, the challenge of course was I did first person from his viewpoint, the entire book, but um, it ended up being something I, I kind of really liked and would like to try doing again. And he was also speaking to the reader a bit too. Yeah, I cheat with that a lot. I, yeah. I think one of those rules is that when, when you know the rules, you can break them. Yeah. I remember when I was writing Tell No One a hundred years ago now, but I was writing the book in, in first person and about like a hundred pages, 90 pages in, I realized I, I kind of wanted to go to third person also. Well, you can't really do that. You either have to be first person or third person or do the alternating chapter thing, mm -hmm. but I did it. And so maybe a quarter of that book is in third person, three quarters of it is in first person. Once you know the rules, you can break it. So there are times that Win will turn and, and sort of face the audience um, and, and, and speak to them, or the reader, I should say. I think you're right. I think there really aren't any rules. I mean, you can do anything writing a, a thriller as long as you do it well. You know, you can be forgiven anything if, if you do it well. And um, thing, I don't think you need to have characters that are, you know, most of the characters I write are, are nice guys. They're likable. They're Adam and the Stranger, or Beck and Tell No One, or, or even Myron. Most of them are family people. Myron is not, but most of them have families and, you know, wives and, or, or in the case of the one the leads, husbands and they're, and they're sort of nice people. But it's not important that they're nice. It's just more important that they're real. Yeah. And also, I think if you're in a, I always say, if you're in a, a bar or a pub, would you want to overhear what this person is saying? And the answer with Win is yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, you, you have to be interesting. Find them compelling, I hope. Yeah, they have to be interesting. Um, so part of the fun of this book is the world that you've created. You know, when going around, he's super, super wealthy. And, you know, he's very well dressed. He says, you know, I'm quite the rake. <laughs> um, he, you know, he goes everywhere by helicopter. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I most enjoyed in this book was the rendezvous app for the super rich. Can we talk about that? Sure. <laughs> so the rendezvous app for the super rich is sort of a, an app where people hook up, but you have to have a net worth of what is it, $100 million to be on the app. And there's a rating system. But the most hilarious part for me was to get to the tryst, you go through the basement of Saks. <laughs> Next with that. <Avenue. laughs> yeah. So uh, I want to ask you, yeah. how do you do your research? I mean, <laughs> you've got 
75 million books in print. You probably own a helicopter and could if you want oh, to. Yes, yeah, several. But do you, do you live this kind of life or do you just know people or how do you do your research on this stuff? I know some, I make a lot, you know, the app is completely fiction. Um, though a lot of rich, my rich friends are calling me up saying, uh, Harlem, I know you didn't make it up. So tell me how I get on this app. I'm like, <laughs> I just, I just, I was trying to figure out how win could still be win and not do the things that were, that in today's world and even win knows are wrong. So how can win still be the way he is? And it's modern, you know, it's modern times. When I first created Myron and Wynn, uh, I think their first book was 1990, it came out in 1995. So I probably wrote it in 1993. A lot of you weren't even born then. But I, I used to have this thing where Myron would call Wynn on his mobile phone. So Wynn could like listen in and make, if he was in danger to know what's going on. And at the time, this was like cutting edge. Of course, now, yeah. that, now that I might as well have two cans and a string by how cutting edge that is. So this is what I thought would be cutting edge that Win would have a an app kind of like this. And I always, and so I was thinking when I'm walking in the city where I'd go and I remember that the vault in the, in Saks Fifth Avenue. And I said, oh, maybe just walk by there. I bet there's a door and I don't know if there's a door or not. And I, you know, Sherry, we give a lot of complicated answers but sometimes the answer is, you know, I make it up. Yeah, I just, just, I, just I just imagine all these Little Harlan Coben fans walking around the basement of Saks <laughs> looking for a door. Say so right now, business would be very good for them, right? People trying to open secret doors over there to get to, <laughs> to, get to be rendezvous. Anyway, the the world of the book is really very fun. Um, so yeah, I guess you know if you talk to friends who have lots of money, or you you probably Google and and do the same things that all the rest of us do. But um, yeah, that was really fun. Um, now. I'd like to ask you how you plot because I've always been a fan of your plotting for many years. Um, you always have lots of strands that seem to be unrelated at the beginning that always, you know, come together. And I'm interested how you do that, how you start. Like you mentioned at the beginning, you know, you wanted to deal with paintings, you wanted to deal with. Um, uh, what you mentioned. Well, What's that? that? An heiress kidnapping. An heiress kidnapping. Now, do you take all these disparate things and find a way to weave them together? How do you how do you go about plotting? I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, I think I write down a lot of ideas. Um, there's usually then one spark that puts it all together. But in this case, right, I, I want to do like 60s radicals, uh, the, mm -hmm. like Weather Underground. I suppose some of them were still hidden today. I want to do an art heist like the Gardner Museum in, in Boston, which still hasn't been solved. Yes. Many paintings, including Vermeer. Yeah, uh, that's a fascinating case. Yeah, it's, you know, it's yeah. incredible. I think every writer at one time thinks about doing that. I want yeah. to do a Patricia Hearst type, um, hit, you know, big kidnapping of, a, a, you know, of, a, of someone um, wealthy. I wanted to do, you know, three or four different things. And that could have been, and uh, mm -hmm. might be three or four different books but the challenge is, is there a way, is there a what if, because everything about writing is a what if, that can start mm -hmm. to put more of those together. And sometimes I start thinking about them as I'm doing it. That's why I never have an idea when I'm done with a book. Every, if someone gives me, if I have an idea while I'm writing a book, it somehow finds its way into that particular book. So the, the challenge becomes, how do I make all of that make sense? How do I you know, it's like, like you're walking through a minefield, right? I'm going to turn a lot of mm -hmm. these on and you may trip, you know, I don't, I don't know how many I'm going to trip in the second half, but how do I get all of those things to work? And in this case, because there, you know, this was, this was so many, Wynn was the kind of the obvious answer. He would be in this world. It could actually be his painting that was stolen. It could be his relative mm -hmm. who was kidnapped. So I love personal stakes too. I never write a book I, or I haven't, I don't think, written a book where a police officer or even Myron is just solving a crime to solve a crime. There always has to be something personal. It's that special episode of Blossom, Harlan Coben novel, if you will. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so when you, so, but how do you, how do you actually come up with that plot? Do you, are you just writing along and, and these, you find it like you have the idea of having wind in the center of them. But right. do you actually, you know, plot it all out on a piece of paper or do you do it as you go along? I'm, I'm curious. I, I know the beginning and the end. So I know the yeah. setup 
and I know who did it. This okay. was a little trickier, and a lot of them are this tricky, but there's like probably three or four revelations that, that come in the last 20 or 30 pages where he's got to solve all those things. And they're not necessarily mm -hmm. the same person. So the art, the kidnapping, all the, you know, the, the 60s radicals, all of those things he needs to solve. So the heart, you know, but I do know the answer to all of those before I mm -hmm. know the ending. I did one of these, and I'd be curious, Shari, you know the ending too, don't you, or don't you? you never. Know, I haven't never got a clue. Know. Never. Not yeah. till the last yeah. chapter. Well, if you ask 10 writers how they do it, you get 11 different answers. Right? I know. That's why I'm asking you, because yeah. I love your plots, and you, and you do one a year, and uh, I just, you know, I'm always looking for a way to try and become more efficient, and I just can't yeah. find one. So you know, I, uh, I always need to know the ending, and then I compare it to driving from my home state of New Jersey to California. I may go Route 80. I may go via the Suez Canal or stop in Tokyo. I always end up in L.A., and as long as, in my case, I know where the ending is so I can kind of see the ending, then I'm more comfortable going off road and being able to fool you because ultimately it's like, you're tr it's like you're, if, you're, if you're following me in a car and I'm trying to lose you. If I know where I'm going, it's easier to lose you, right? I can right. go parking lots. I can go whatever way I'm going. Um, so that's kind of how I do it. I know, I, I, I know a few spots I'll definitely stop on the way. Um, mm -hmm. And then I kind of go from there, but not 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 nothing. Not everything else is planned out. Hmm. With me, I'm just going, and I never know how it's going to end until it's all like, over. Are you? El Doctorow has a great quote on writing where he says that writing is like driving at night in the fog with just your headlights on. You can only see a little bit ahead of you, but you can make the whole journey that way. So yeah, you see a little bit ahead of you. It's not like you're yeah. doing right. Yeah. Ten pages maybe or something like that. Yeah, that's that's a great quote. <laughs> Yeah, I live by by that one. Yeah, yell doctor. Yeah. So let's say, you know, you write your book and then what's your revision process like? Do you do a lot of revision or, or do you write beautifully right from the get go? I don't know any writer who doesn't do a lot of revision. Well, there's the one guy, but none of us want to hang out with him, right, Sherry? So yeah. um, I, I, re I revise as I go along. So I don't write, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to do it on the correct way on, on my screen, but I don't write in a straight line like this. I kind of write like this, where each day I go back and I reread what I did the day before Yeah. as a start. And then I go back maybe every 75 pages or so, I go back to the beginning. In fact, I'm at that stage in my book right now. And I'll, I'll read the whole thing all the way through up to 75, 100, 150, whatever it is. Um, it helps me get a running start. It helps me keep track of where I'm going. Um, so the first chapter, by the time the book is done would have already been rewritten 10 times yeah and you yeah similar i do go back and i i do a bit of overlap each day to get going into the next day but then i do an awful lot of revision because i don't plan anything and i don't know where my ending's going to be so i do a lot of revision so you got to go back and put the clue into chapter four that you didn't have well, yet. what's what's interesting is the clues are often there like all these right. little unconscious things are all there and i go Oh, it's already there. I don't even have to put that in. It was pointing to this at the end. Don't you find your mind works that way? Yep. Like your conscious mind is always planting things and developing things for you. It's great. All of my, all, almost all of my revisions is on prose. It's almost never on, on, on plot. Mm -hmm. um, how it happened, you know, I, I talked to uh, my friend Lee Child, the Reacher novelist, uh, and quite frequently he and I do events together and we talk about this. And his sort of thing is like, when I wrote that, that's how it happened. I can't go back and make it happen a different way. <laughs> I wouldn't go quite that far, but I, yeah. I kind of see where he's coming from, where it is all making sense. I may not see yeah. all of the clues, and all of a sudden I realize, oh, wait a minute, I did put that already in, so that will add up in the end. I don't yeah. know if you're subconscious or <laughs> hopes for he's eternal. Yeah, well, I, I think it's the unconscious, and I, I count on mine to do things for me. Um, and how would you describe yourself as a writer? Are you a disciplined writer? Are you a, I guess you would have to be with the output that you've got. You must, what do you do, write eight, eight hours a day or? No, I, I, I'm, I think about it all the time. I'm terrible company. I don't really have any other interests. Um, so when I sit down and write, it's already been written in my head pretty, a, a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so and I'm also a streak writer. I don't do the the two thousand words a day or five, whatever it is. I don't do anything like that. I don't do a chapter a day. And normally, my 
normal way of doing it. The book is 500 pages long and takes me nine months to write it. Um, somewhere around the eight month mark, I won't be, I'll maybe be on page 250. And the last half oh. will be written in, a, in no more than a month. The last 40 pages of when I did in one day. It wasn't a pretty day. You wouldn't want to <laughs> hang with me that day. But, and I grow a playoff beard. I don't shave. I don't shower. I don't change my socks. My kids walk by the room and throw, say, throw daddy a banana and then they run away, you know. Um, but that's normally, as much as I keep trying to be more disciplined, I don't find it works for me. And you? Oh, I'm, I'm the opposite of you in lots of ways. I, I'm the, the 2000 words a day, like consistent, um, you know, if I, if, if I had to do 40 pages in a day at the end with a deadline, I'd just scream and cry. I don't think I could. I don't think I could. Oh, I scream and cry. Oh, fair. Good. Okay. <laughs> no, there's lots of whining that goes on with being a writer, as you know. <laughs> oh, I know. Whining and gin and tonic and, you know, various other things. So I want to know, you know, doing a book a year and all of these TV productions you do, how do you manage to do all that work? Like I, I, you know, I've seen quite a few of your Netflix shows. In fact, I've seen all of them, you know, um, Stranger, The Safe, The Five, The Boy in the Woods. I've seen them all. I'm waiting for the new one coming out, The Innocents. How do you, how do you do a book a year and manage all of that? Like, do you have a personal assistant? Do you, do you not sleep? Like, how, how do you manage it all? You're like a superhero. Well, first of all, I can't wait. The Innocent comes out on Netflix April 30th. You can put it in your remind list now so they remind you. April 30th. Um, it's 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 good. It's Netflix Spain. It's a guy named Oriel Paolo, though. It'll be in, either dubbed, and this is actually a pretty good dubbing, um, yeah. or I always recommend the subtitles. Yeah, subtitles all the way. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing. It's, it's, I think, the best of the adaptations, which I didn't say. No one... I know it's 446 people here. No one say that outside of this room. So I'm really excited about The Innocent. It also depends on the show. The English language shows um, The Five, Safe, The Stranger, and we're right now filming Stay Close. Maybe some of you know Kush Jumbo from, uh, it's a cat, British cast, but Kush Jumbo, who was in The Good Wife, um, James Nesbitt, Richard Armitage, who was in The Stranger, played Adam mm -hmm. The Stranger back with us, Eddie Azar. Okay. It's really great. It's a great cast, and we're filming that right now. In Manchester, on those I do a lot. Um, the European, the uh, foreign language ones, one I do a fair amount, but not. It's not every day because they can't translate everything for me. I uh, talk to the director, but I, it's not quite as hands-on. Here's the thing: I have the time because I have really, and I recommend this if you want to be a writer. I have no other interests. I mean, <laughs> I'm a father and I'm a writer, and my kids have grown now. You know, my youngest is at Brown University. So my four yeah. kids have grown. I got the dogs. They gave me a second. My kids got a second dog, which is, you know, knowing I would take care of it. So that distracts me a little bit. I, but I, I actually recommend that. Um, so I don't, because of that, what else am I going to do with my day? What else am I going to do with myself? I have no other marketable skill. Um, That's I, true of so many writers, don't you find? Yeah. we. Have, I can't imagine what else I would do. Exactly. And that yeah. fear, does that fear, that, that fear bring you back sometimes to writing and working harder? It's like, oh my God, if I don't have an idea, I'm going to have to get a real job. That I know. I still have bad dreams all the time about being in a job place and I don't know how to do the job. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> All the time. Like, like this week I've had job dreams like that. It's just something that never goes away where, where I go back to the workplace and I, I have to do a job. I had one last week where I was working in Microsoft, which is absolutely ridiculous because I'm horrible with technology. And I thought, I can't do this. But the woman who hired me was my Toronto publicist. And I thought it's going to be OK. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's interesting. So anyway, yeah. that's it. And I recommend it. You know, I, I, telling this story that a, a, a rock star told about another rock star. So he's talking to his friend who's two big rock stars. And his rock star friend, of course, they're both super wealthy. So they bought a guy bought a second house and and he started to you know put put you know whatever. He, he got really into Persian carpets, really, and started okay. collecting them. And he started to travel to see them. And he would go on weekends to antique stores. And he forgot to do music, right? Uh, he got so into the Persian rugs that he forgot to make music. Um, so having a hobby, I don't, you know, I don't collect vases. I don't like stamps. 
I don't even know what I would do. But those things, uh, I hate to, it makes me a, a, a you know, one dimensional person maybe, and maybe not as happy and fulfilled as those of you who can, who have hobbies and, and enjoy them. But this is the only thing I kind of enjoy doing is to have you contact me and say, you know what? I started when 11 o'clock last night, I stayed up to five in the morning. I kind of hate and love you. I love that. That's my, that's my thing. Let's keep that going. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask you again about the film, the film work, TV work. Do you write those screenplays or do you just yeah. consult on them or, or how does that go? It depends on the project. Mostly I'm in charge of the English language ones of the story. So if okay. we broke it down, it would probably be story by me, teleplay by whoever. So we have a, a team of, of there's four of us that have been the core team of all the British shows uh, uh, and we, uh, two of us, me and another guy, really break, sit down. And we break out the episodes a lot, um, and then of course it be, we keep changing it as it goes on. We, the writer himself will change it, but they stay pretty close to the outline that that I and this other guy, you know, work oh. on. And coming up. It's a much, it's a team effort. I'm the captain of the team. I compare, you know, when you have a the, when the book hit today, you hit the list. It's like a tennis player and I won Wimbledon, right? I'm standing there and I'm so proud I won Wimbledon. When you do a TV series, it's like you're winning the World Cup and you're captain of that team. And you, But you don't care who does the scoring. You just want to win. And you want all those players to go home and get huge contracts from their other teams. Um, and it's fun because you're celebrating and you're collaborating with other with other people, so that's how I how I would how I would compare it. But every day they send me what they filmed the day before, and I watch it. You know, I don't watch all of it because it's literally, if you're watching three minutes of TV, it was probably an hour and a half of filming of you know different angles and what shots we're going to use and things like that. Okay. Yeah, it's been an interesting process. Yeah, interesting. Um, one thing I really enjoy about your books is the the intertextuality, how, how, how everyone interacts with everyone else, you know, where and when he's he's thinking about things that he did with Myron. And one, one thing I really enjoyed was when he did the the rendezvous app and he goes to meet the 9.85 <laughs> woman and it happened to be um, Myron's ex fiance yeah. um, or, or ex wife, ex fiance. Ex fiance, yeah. Ex -fiance. Yeah, I just I find that sort of thing really enjoyable, and I think probably your fans do too. That they like the um, the connections between the different books and the different characters. I find that really really fun. Yeah, the Jessica hadn't been in a book that I've written, I don't think, in almost twenty years. Um, when she she dumped Myron, and Myron kind of then dumped her back. And uh, it was actually funny in the beginning when I used to write that series. People get angry because they didn't really think Jessica and Myron were a good match, and I was always like. Well, don't you know people in real life who aren't good matches? That's what makes it kind of compelling. I mean, I don't want them to necessarily um, be a good match. And so it was really kind of fun. I love when he, and it wasn't, I wasn't planned before I started to write it somewhere in the middle or somewhere, well, it was fairly early on, wherever it was a few chapters before I wrote it, I, I thought about having Jessica come back and, 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 and so people could see her again. And, and, may, and if you never met her, it makes no difference. Like you never met her before and it made no difference to your enjoyment. That's also always the key that it doesn't change anything that if you're, if you've never read one of my books, when can be your first book and you won't feel lost. If yeah. you have, you may have a different dimensions of what you enjoy or don't enjoy. Right. And then if you have read the other ones, it's, it's even more enjoyable to see these characters come back. And, um, oh, we hope. um so I'm going to ask you, what's the best writing advice? you've ever received the number one writing advice in the world was comes from Elmore Leonard I was there the first time he said it Elmore Leonard made these rules of writing and he started did it in a speech at a voucher con and my favorite one is I try to cut out all the parts you'd normally skip that's just genius yeah and I do it doesn't, you know, on every page, every paragraph, every sentence, every word, I ask myself, is this compelling? Is this yeah. gripping? Is this moving the story forward? It doesn't you know, mean you can't have themes or emotion or descriptions. You can, but even those have to be, you know, the, the grass can't just be tall. It's got to be tall enough to go be able to go on the adult rides at Six Flags. You know, it has to be mm -hmm. something a little bit different 
and, and, and better, right as though there's a knife by your throat, right as though you're a caveman. And if you bore somebody, they're going to pick up a large club and hit you over the head with it. And I try to write with that kind of energy, no matter what I'm writing. It mm -hmm. could be, uh, I've done editorials, whatever it is, I, you, you try to write as though every word matters and you can get rid of it if it's not working. That's good advice. Have you ever had any really bad advice? Bad writing advice? Drink heavily. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, well, I don't think so. I'm trying to remember. I, the only advice I've had that I thought was kind of bad advice was write what you know. And, and you know, and I think if, if everyone just wrote what they knew, we'd, we'd be missing out on a lot of really good creative imaginative stuff, you know? Yeah. Well, what do we know about murder and mayhem and well, kinky exactly. sex? Well, kinky sex, exactly. but just kidding. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, it's sometimes, you know, they do it sometimes on these on TV shows where they make fun of the the kind of beauty actor and they just say just, you know, uh, the famous Lawrence Olivier when he was making a marathon man with, with uh, Dustin Hoffman. And Dustin Hoffman's like, I'm not sure how do I get into this character? And he's like, just pretend you're that person. You know, it's not that that difficult. So it's the same kind of a thing. Mm. So you're a pretty recognizable guy. Um, you know, you have your pictures in the backs of, of your books. Do you ever, do you have any um, interesting fan interactions that you can tell us about? Anything odd that ever happened to you or funny? Not really. I mean, no? I actually get recognized much more when I'm in traveling in France for some reason than I do here. Really? But what's okay. good about what I look like is if I want to go incognito, I just put a hat on and no one recognizes me. <laughs> Literally, you know, Moshe Dayan, the old defense minister from Israel, who was famous for the eye patch, what he would do when he would want to go out is he'd take the eye patch off and put on sunglasses. So he could walk anywhere. No one that would do it. Him. I remember him. Yeah, that would do it. So that would do it was the same. It's sort of the it's sort of the uh, same thing. I also have a number of friends who are, who are really famous and I get to see that side. And most of the time people think I'm their bodyguard. Um, so it's not something that um, it's not an aspect I relish, you know, I, I do love interaction with readers. Um, but I, it's not like I get ever gets writers don't get stopped. That's the beauty of what, what we have. We have some of the advantages of fame. Yeah. You, know, you need tickets to something you could probably get them and that kind of a thing. But yeah. we're rarely recognized. Are you recognized very much? I mean, no, it, like the offset. The reason I'm, I'm asking is I, I had an experience on a train into New York uh, a couple of years ago where I sat down and the woman next to me was reading one of my books. And I said, oh, I leaned over and I said, oh, I wrote that. And she cringed, so she went away from me like I was some kind of a nutter on the train. And she clearly didn't believe me. And I ended up you know, taking out my driver's license to prove to her who I was. But I don't imagine that would happen to you. Like they would look at you and go, yeah, that's Harlan Coben. Um, a number of years ago when I was in France, someone was at reading my book out in public and um, I don't speak French. So I walked up to the person. Usually, I don't say anything. In fact, if you look at my uh, Twitter, I have a picture of a woman who was sitting in front of me in a plane who fell asleep reading my book. <laughs> I didn't take the picture while she was reading it. When she fell asleep, I was so excited. My kids were cracking up, like, shh, shh, quiet, don't wake her up. So, you know, I took the picture. So she's sitting there with a the book like this. And I have several <laughs> and my friends tell me these when they, when they see them. But I walked up to the person at the time. I said, you know, that's my book. And like, no, no, it's my book. Like they thought I was trying to take I'm trying to point to my picture on the back and they kind of just weren't having any of it. That's the kind of thing I mean. Strange things happen, eh? Um, so we might see some more win books. I sure hope so. Yeah, yeah. Man, plan, man plans, God laughs, which is what Myron Bolotar always says. So I don't yeah. know. But my guess is I'm not done with, I'm certainly not done with Myron and Win. I don't know if the next one I do of them would be from Myron's viewpoint, Win's viewpoint, both viewpoint, just Myron, just when I don't, I don't know any of that yet. I never know what I'm going to do yeah. after the book I'm writing. Never. I just can only focus on the book I'm writing right now. And what are you writing right now? So I'm writing. When I wrote a book last that came out last year called The Boy from the Woods, and intentionally I didn't give the boy's origin story, how he ended up in the woods as a child. So this book opens up. He's sitting across from his father. We get you know. So this this book is him trying to find out. Um, how, you know, how he ended up in the woods as a child, he ends up in the woods and doesn't know how he got there. He always, all he remembers is, is being in the woods. He doesn't remember ever being raised by parents like a, 
a Mowgli or Tarzan. He just doesn't remember. No one knows what happened to him. And now he's an adult and he still doesn't know. So this book will answer that question. But what's weird, not that everything has ever happened to you, Shari, like this, but if you, if you either watch The Stranger or you read The Stranger, at the end, The Stranger gets away. Mm-hmm. And I never really thought much about it, that I wrote that book six or seven years ago. But all of a sudden, I'm on about page 60 or 70 of this book, and The Stranger popped up. So this may end up being a sequel to both The Stranger and The Boy from the Woods. See, I like that. I like that yeah, intertextuality. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm looking forward to that one. No, I love The Stranger. Thank I you. I thought that was just fabulous. Thank you. Thanks. Um, you're at the top of the heap. You've got, you know, you've done 33 books. You've got all these 14 Netflix series going. You're number one, New York Times. Does it ever get easier? No. No, I thought you'd say that. To, I don't think it'd be as satisfying if it got easier. I mean, yeah. you know, this was a heck of a week. I love when being out. I love promoting it. And I'm still a, you know, still a kid hoping that it'll do, it'll hit the New York Times bestseller list and all of those things. Um, mm-hmm. It's more relaxed in the sense that I get it doesn't matter as much. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's a, you know, I, I it's not like it, I, I'm not going to be published again or I'm going to be poor if I doesn't work out. So that kind of pressure is off. So I enjoy it maybe more, mm-hmm. but I never, I'm not good at easing up. Um, it just is not my personality. Yeah. So uh, I think when it gets easier, first of all, only bad writers think they're good, right? Have you noticed that, Shari? Yeah, like the writer yeah I always take my books, yeah. I... Yeah, we always, there's always <laughs> that moment. And I always tell so, like, yeah. I'll be writing like, you know, I'll be writing the book right now and I'll be going, oh my God, this sucks. Yeah. I was so good before. What yeah. happened? Then I'll go, oh my God, this is so great. That other book sucks, you know? And this kind of stuff goes on all of the time. I know. Do you know, about a week ago, about a month ago, I was struggling with my latest book. And one day I said to my agent, I said, you know what? This is really good. I think this is one of the best books I've ever written. And she goes, just a minute, I'm writing that down. <laughs> she wrote it down. She put a date on it. And then she she uh, sent a text with a picture of it to me yesterday. Very <laughs> much. Right now, right, it's a love-hate relationship. Yeah. And I think when you, if you, the writers who don't go through this are probably starting to sort of phone it in. And, you know, I know Stephen King a couple books ago, he kindly used me as a character in a book and he he asked my permission like I was going to say no. But when he said it to me, I could tell he was kind of like nervous about my reaction and how the how are people going to like this book? And I'm like, dude, you're Stephen King. Yeah, they'll do it. So you, I don't think it ever goes. That's what makes him so great. You know, I don't think it ever goes away. No, no, I think you're right. All right, I have a couple of quick questions and then we have to go to questions from the audience. Okay. Um, what is your secret snack when you're writing? Um, she said, I don't really have one. You don't have a secret snack? No, mostly I've been doing nuts lately. Uh, with cashews and, and almonds, though I love Yasso frozen yogurt bars. Yasso, if you hear me, please <laughs> send me free bars because I just promoted your product i'm getting nothing for that but i'm into yasso frozen yogurt bars cool and one other quick question your dog laszlo do you put him in your acknowledgments laszlo is laszlo is a, is a character sometimes in the book and i now have another dog named winslow ah. one of them are here i kept them downstairs tonight sorry people um they are the most popular part of my instagram and twitter and so we have a new puppy who Winslow is six months old and the two of them are a little too adorable and distracting together. So if I'm a little uh-huh. slower on the book, we can blame the dogs. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I think we've gone a little over. So I have to switch over to Roz and she's gonna um, moderate the questions for us. Hi, um, Hi thank you so much, both of you, Sherry and Harlan for that great discussion. It was so much fun to, to listen to your conversation. Um, before we actually go into questions on the audience, we are first going to do a couple polls um, that we're going to launch just to get um, some information from our audience. So those should be launching right now, I believe. There we go. There's two questions on this poll. One's just to let us know how many people are watching on your device since we can't see you and can't do a head count. And the other one is just to let us know how you learned about this event. 
while we're while they're doing that, I just want to also point out that you guys are really I assume most of you are from the Chicago or this area. Right. Um, first of all, I've never heard so many libraries in my life, but you guys, I've, I've been to that area and I know how great your libraries and those two or three independent bookstores that you have on the list are and how valuable they are to your community. There is really no great community I've ever been to when I travel around doing these that don't have a great library. It's just, exactly. It goes Same. hand in hand. And so when you're supporting your library, you're actually increasing the value of your home when you resell it. And think about your independent bookstore. If that's not there, it's going to be a, a banana republic or a gap or some crap like that, or <laughs> a sub sandwich place or something really, you know, chain sub sandwich place. So support those bookstores, keep supporting the library. It really pays off in so many different ways. You know, we all grew up with libraries, so mm -hmm. you have to let the next generation do that too. And that's my it's all people? like one ecosystem, the libraries, the authors, the booksellers, they all kind of, yeah each other do you ever get people you know that they apologize that they got your book out of the library and they go don't apologize it's fantastic that you get my book out of the library no, i love I it i think that's fabulous i'm just hoping right now there's a wait list Roz. i hope there's a wait list yeah. <laughs> just kidding but yes no i look i discovered most of my favorite writers when i was growing up i discovered at yeah. the library now but then you start buying the books as a writer i'm sure shara you'll agree with this i don't really care how you like i don't when I get these questions like, oh, do you want audio or ebook or I don't care if you read it on stone tablets. Yeah. Or if you, if you borrow it from a friend, even, yeah, you know, you want to be read. I, you know, yeah. we to, you know, I want I, I don't care. I, I just want to have that one on one thing that we get to. Mm -hmm. have. Sorry, Roz. We're talking and I think we have one more poll that we're going to put up also. Um, here we go. So this is to <laughs> see how big a how big a fan are you? Let's see so if which one work. of these statements is not true? So take a look. We're going to leave them up there for a little bit, and you can vote, and then we will share the results. I think I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you should know. I'm not positive, but I think I know. <laughs> oh, I'm not allowed to vote. <laughs> I think I know, though. Okay, so we're sharing the results. So 46% of people thought that Little, Little League Baseball inducted Harlan Coben into their Hall of Fame of Excellence. But that actually is true, correct? Oh. <laughs> okay. That's the one I picked. <laughs> so the one that is not true for everyone at home is the final one, correct? Harlan Coben just announced that a new Myron novel is in the works. No, so that. that is not true. The rest of them are true. Yep, Little yes. League. If you go to Williamsport, where they have the baseball, the, the Little League Hall of uh, the Little League Finals, um, you can actually see me in the museum. I got to throw out the first pitch to the team from Japan. Wow. It was really an awesome experience. But you must golf, don't you? I do you golf. Must, you must Not golf. Well, yeah. But I yeah. golf. But it's yeah. a terrible sport. Why I didn't smash a glass and jam it in my eye, I don't know. Instead, I took up golf. <laughs> The one thing I do do. So we do have a just, bunch of questions from our from our audience. So I'm gonna try to get to a few of them. So let's see. Um, Greg would like to know: Do any of your friends or family members ever think you are writing about your acquaintances or private fantasies, and does it ever make you feel insecure? Uh, no, it does make me feel insecure. My friends always think the cool characters are. <laughs> They never say, you know that loser with halitosis who never gets any of the girls? That's me, right? That's me. They never think that. The humpback never sees the hump in his own back. So I never really worry if I take anything negative from somebody because they never they never see it. That said, my friends know that what they say, what they tell me in their lives is, you know, I won't point out exactly who it was, but I, that's open season. You know, I eavesdrop. I'm sure Shari, same thing. You yeah, it's all material. Yep. Yeah. So... No, I never feel bad about it. Sorry. Um, let's see. Mary Kay would like to know how the pandemic influenced your writing. Just how did that impact you? Did you was it harder to be creative? Did you have lots of time to be creative? Uh, I think, you know, as I do in any year, I went through a lot of ups and downs. When it first hit, which about a year ago, I was right about to go on book tour for um, The Boy from the Woods. Uh, I was paralyzed. I didn't write at all. 
Then I got into a really good, comfortable stretch. Then I got bad again. Um, I do think, you know, look, this is a nightmare. It's a nightmare for everybody. Uh, but for writers, so you know, we 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 social isolate anyway. Um, mm -hmm. I am a socially adept introvert. I mean, I could talk to you now, but I will get exhausted and I will pass out as soon as this is over. <laughs> um, but I, so I don't mind being alone. I'm not going to put the pandemic yet in the book because one, I was writing when when this happened. So mm -hmm. by the time the next March would come around, I didn't know what the pandemic would be in March of last year. I don't know what it'll be in July this year. So I don't want to do it until maybe this is all over and I can look back on it. I don't even think then. And also lastly, and then I'll let Shari answer, um, I think part of our job is to give you that escapism. And when it first yeah. hit, The Stranger had just come out on Netflix, The Boy from the Woods had just come out, and a lot of you were kind enough to write. This is how I'm, you know, this is helping me get through um, COVID. So, you know, I don't want to watch a show about COVID. So I, I wouldn't want to write one. Shari? I agree. I agree completely. <laughs> I, I'm so sick of COVID. I can't wait for it to be over. And um, I think most writers aren't, aren't really touching it. We want to has um, a question from Linda. She said, are you thinking about doing any more young adult novels? She's a high school librarian and she says that we need you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Boys reading. Thank you. Uh, I, I wrote three, a trilogy, and that's that's going to be it, I think, um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is, is that with the TV series, I can't do both. I could do young adult and adult novel in a year. I, I really have to pick and choose. It was always intended to be a trilogy. And the other thing is my characters age and change. So Mickey and Ema and Spoon would do the same. They'd be out of high school by now. In fact, if you read uh, when Ema is in. So what I tell the kids are, once they finish those three, I think they're old enough for the most part to start moving into Myron Bolotar. Home is really, which is an adult novel, is really the fourth Mickey Bolotar novel. And Wynn is also, if you want to follow the lives of the three lead characters, you will see at least one of them in that. So my guess is Mickey will be back. Mickey and the gang will be back again, but probably a little bit older and in Myron Bolotar novels. So here's a question that um, actually both Harlan and Sherry could answer. Um, it's from Helena. And she would like to know, do you have a traditional way to celebrate the end of a book? Um, for some reason, so she pictures Harlan with like a glass of champagne or something. Well, that's but fine. Anyhow, do both of you have a tradition? Gary, you want to take that first? Oh, I, I do the champagne. I always get the bottle of champagne for every good occasion. Um, this is you. I'll do a quick impression of typing the end. You know, uh, it's usually, <laughs> it usually comes at some weird hour. It's just the best. It really is. People are the best feeling, and this is going to sound, and I really, I, I knew this the other night for the first time, so I'll say it again. Usually I'm in tears at the end of the book. It sounds really weird, but I really get caught up in whatever emotion. If I'm not, it's probably not working, but whatever emotion, not that I'm leaving these characters and not going to see them again or any of that kind of writerly talky stuff, but I, I'm genuinely being moved by what Wynn's predicament is and where he's going to go next, and I do get caught up in the emotion of it. So I will find myself welling up when I finish a book. Uh, and then, you know, celebrations are, are more muted because I really am physically exhausted. I feel like I just mm -hmm. went 15 rounds in a boxing match and I, and I can't even lift my arms. Uh, we have a couple, a few people have asked in the Q&A. Um, they're interested to know if you write on the computer or do you use pencil and paper? Shari, you want to take that one first? Oh, I everything on the keyboard. I couldn't possibly write by hand. My handwriting is, you can't read it. I can't read it. I can't read my handwriting either, but I do both. Um, the key to my, my later writing saying that I like to say is that if it produces pages, good. If it doesn't produce pages, bad. That's my whole life, right? If it produces pages, helps me produce pages. So sometimes, most times, I, I should say most times, a lot of times I'll write straight on the, on the word processor. Sometimes I'll have a notebook. Sometimes I'll do both. Um, there's something for, to me freeing and childlike about having pen to paper. Also, you can cross out and still see it. When you delete something on a computer, it's gone forever. And the last thing is, besides being able to think on paper, when I then 
every I do it like in 10 page spurts, let's say. So if I do 10 pages on here and I put it on my computer, my first draft is already my second draft. So right. the answer to that question is, and I know Shari agrees with this answer, whatever makes you write, mm -hmm. hit stone tablets together. So I know a friend that talks into one of these. Uh, then he, then he, he knows he can't really use that, but then he can use it because he, he knows where he's going. Mm -hmm. Takes walks and he talks into one. Yeah, that's going to work. Whatever's going to get you moving. Mm -hmm. We have another question kind of along those lines um, for both of you. They want to know if you've ever attended a writer's retreat. Did you find that helpful? Or what was your experience like? Sure. I've never been to one. Um, sounds nice if it's in a castle in France, but no, I've, I've never been to one. I've never been to a writer's retreat. I've been to a number of, of, of crime writing festivals like Boucher oh, yeah. and those kind of conferences. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for me, they do work um, in, a, in, a, in, in, in ways maybe they're not supposed to, but I do come home whenever I'm with a lot of people and I'm busy like that because of my personality, all I want to do is lock myself in a room. It's why I answer Shari's question before maybe a little better when they like if I go on the set of the TV show, if I fly over and I and I'm, I'm there for like three or four days, I, I want to I'm like, oh, my God, I got to get home and I got to lock myself in a room and write. So it almost works that it helps me in that kind of a way. You know, being crowded or being around a lot of people makes me long to be alone and to write. Um, with a few people that would like to know what you're currently reading. Ooh, um, I know what I'm reading. Right. I have almost finished the new Lisa Unger, which is really, really good. It's called Last Girl Ghosted. And I, I highly recommend it, but it won't be out till like next October. I just got an advanced copy of Alison Galen's next book called The Collective, which is awesome. Um, you know, I'm, she's been kind of flying under the radar. I think this book will probably change that. I also just finished one. I'm so bad at the name. But is it called Who is Maud Dixon uh, by Alexandra Andrews, I think her last name is. And that was a really good uh, crime fiction story also. I just want to say, Harlan, you're a great champion of women writers. And we all really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Because a lot of men don't read women writers. And Harlan clearly does. Yeah, well, I've read everything Shari. For those who were here for <laughs> me, I have read every Shari book. Oh, thank uh, you. If you want really great suspense uh, and you haven't yet discovered Shari LaPena, well, that's what you're here for. So, well, thank you. Yeah, it goes without saying. I, I, I choose a lot of people to, to do this talk with. Last one was with John Grisham. This was with Shari LaPena. So, <laughs> I, only, I only pick people who I think are awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Our last question from um, our audience is um, a lot of people want to know if you would pick. Along the lines of your favorite book, or if you would pick up one of your own book to read, which one would it be? What book's my favorite of mine? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Win. Now available in hardcover. <laughs> That's the right answer. Mine would be, I don't know, I'm I'm so tired of my books when I finish them, to be honest. So probably the the more distance I get from them, the more I'd like. So I'd probably go back to the first one, the couple next door. But um yeah, I guess the answer is my favorite book is Not a Happy Family, which will be out in the summer. Yeah. Well, it's, my it's very best. Serving. I'm the opposite, where the closer a book is to me, the more I like it. Because it's like, you know, that essay you wrote when you were in college, you thought was brilliant, you find it now, and you read it, and you go, wow, I was an idiot. What was I thinking? <laughs> that's how I feel about old novels. Uh, I don't, I never go back and reread them. So usually whatever I'm writing currently is how, is, is my, is my favorite, whichever one just mm -hmm. was released. I know we've covered so much. Um, we've covered so much about the writing process and your books, and we've gotten so many wonderful comments from people in the Q&A also just that have loved hearing from both of you. Um, I'm going to invite Grace um, from Glencoe Library to come back, uh, to come on and um, kind of wrap us up with a few announcements. Thanks, Roz. Um, well, that's it for this evening's program. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. And thanks especially to Sherry LaPena for doing a fabulous job facilitating this fun and interesting conversation. And of course, to Mr. Harlan Coben, who has surely made a lot of new fans tonight. 
Um, a reminder that if you'd like to buy a copy of Wynne, you're invited to do so using a purchase link to the local independent booksellers, the Bookstall and Barbara's Books Bookstore. The links will be included in the follow-up email that we'll be sending out tomorrow. Naturally, you can also borrow a copy from your local library. Please remember that if you missed part of tonight's event, or if you um, if you know someone who would like to see it, Mr. Coben very nicely permitted us to record this. The, vid the video will be available through your library's YouTube channel sometime next week. Good night, everyone. Thank, All right, you. thank you. Sorry, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. See you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Good night. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.